and welcome to the Go Fermenter Winery Chat. We do this every Wednesday. Uh, we took a break last week, but we're back on. As you know, my format is I spend a few minutes talking about some topic of interest to me and to you. Then we do the formal topic for the day. Today it's building a small winery, the Go Fermenter way. And then usually this show is live, so you can call in with your questions. But we've changed the format. The live production was rather difficult to do. So it'll be the same time every Wednesday, noon Eastern time, but it won't really be live. So you can send in your questions via text or email and I will answer them either personally or on the next episode. So uh, it's something to think about if you're going to make a new winery, you really need to know a lot about many different things. Winemaking, legal issues, uh, marketing, labeling, and one of the greatest resources is a UC Davis online course. They offer several courses. Some are uh, short and simple, and one is the, I believe it's three semesters or four semesters. Uh, these are really very useful. I took this some years ago, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot about the economics of winemaking, uh, regulatory issues. But the one thing I learned that really stayed with me and I found very fascinating is how to read a label. Um, in America, the back label is, has certain verbiage required by law. So the next time you go to buy a wine at the wine store and you pick up a bottle, right? Don't worry about the front label. That's just marketing. The real action is in the back label. And the back label by law can say one of basically four things. It can say vintage and bottled, it can say bottled, it can say cellared and bottled. These terms all mean the same thing. What it means is that somebody, the person selling the bottle, bought the wine from somebody else. It was already made. They bottled it, put their label on, and marketed it. They didn't even make the wine at all. The second level label you'll see, it'll say produced and bottled. What this means is they purchased the grapes from somebody, fermented, made the wine, and then bottled it. One level up in quality. The next thing you might see is grown, produced, and bottled. And this means exactly what it says. They grew the grapes, they made the wine from the grapes, and bottled it. This is kind of the highest level. For a Napa wine, you're going to be in the 90 buck range for a bottle that's grown, produced, and bottled. Now, there is a fourth category called estate bottle. And this is really the pinnacle of winemaking. And what it means is that they grew the grapes, they produced the wine, and they bottled it, and this whole operations were within a certain controlled area. Uh, a family owned all the different pieces, they're located geographically close, something like that. So a state bottle is the best you can get. So anyway, that's my little ramble on uh, labeling and UC Davis. So yeah, look into the course, and we're going to start our topic today, which is building a small winery the go fermenter way. So if you're planning a winery, one resource you should consider is our planning guide. It's on our website under the support tab and it's a PDF file you can download. Now what I'm gonna talk about today is covered in this resource guide. So don't take any notes, don't write down things. Everything there is in the planning guide. First of all, some numbers. What is a small winery anyway? Okay, so let's look at some numbers. One ton of grapes gives you about 160 gallons of wine around 800 bottles, or about 67 cases. So 20 tons grapes per year would give you about 1,300 cases of wine. And so you would need about five to 10 go fermenters to make this quantity. The reason why this number is a bit variable is because it depends on when you get your grapes. If you get your grapes over a period of time, then you can use the same go fermenter over and over again. If you get them all at the same time, then you need more units. We have a customer that does up to almost 30 tons with just 10 units. Now obviously, the go fermenter technology is scalable, but realistically, you're looking at wineries with 5,000 cases per year or less of an annual uh, production rate. Now, some large wineries can use the go fermenter. They better use it for their entire production, but they use it for specialty batches, artisanal production, something they're doing that requires special handling. So we're gonna look at some basic operations of a, of a winery. There's obviously grape preparation, fermentation, pressing, and racking. 
This is also blending, which is highly underrated in importance, and also bottling and labeling. We're not going to talk about blending and bottling and labeling today. We'll leave that for another episode. So grape preparation. You need to destem the grapes. Uh, so here you see a picture of a destemmer. This one is quite interesting because it has a built-in pump. If you're going to buy a destemmer for the first time, buy it with a pump because you can see that on that right diagram. You simply connect a two-inch hose from the outlet of the destemmer into the inlet of the go fermenter liner, and you can simply pump the destemmed grapes into it. Now, if your grapes are already destemmed, uh, maybe they're machine picked or you have some kind of destemmer, then you will need a must pump to actually pump this grape, crushed grape um, must into the fermentation bag. I show an example here. Uh, these are unfortunately quite expensive, but if you have one lying around, it's an easy way to fill the go fermenter liner with a hose. The other way you can fill it with grapes is to actually cut a slit into the liner. In the manual, we tell you how to do this. There's a specific spot where you cut a slit, use bungee cords to hold it open, and now you can dump the grapes in either manually or through a gravity feed from your destemmer or a hopper or some other way. At the end of this, you can close the uh, uh, bag up with a special food grade tape that we provide. So you tape over the slit and now the bag is completely sealed and usable for punching and pressing just as if it was never cut at all. So here we have a little video of how this is done. You see here we're destemming into our destemmer, which happens to be uh, one with a built-in pump. Here you see the crushed grapes and grapes going in. Here's the alternative method where we're filling through a hopper through that slit and then closing it with the tape. You can see that over here. For fermentation, obviously we recommend the go fermenter since we make them. Uh, and by the way, we are open for uh, orders and shipping, so uh, please, if you need something, go on the website. Now, the floor space you need is about four feet by four feet. You can see the, the picture of the go fermenter there. It has a footprint of four by four. and need about eight feet headspace because when you press the, and punching, the bag inflates and rises above the lip of the container. Power requirements are elementary, simple, household receptacle, 110 volts, five amps, nothing special at all. You do need some means of moving it around. So you need a pallet jack, a forklift, or something so you can move this pallet around. Empty, it weighs about 130 pounds, and full, it can contain up to a ton of grapes in it. So you need something you can uh, manipulate the pallet with. Also, you will probably need some sort of chilling system. So we recommend that you install a recirculating uh, water or recirculating glycol line that's providing you with chilled uh, liquid so you can connect up the go coolers to it and use it to control temperature. And that's really my next slide here about temperature control. This confuses people a little bit. Uh, it's really quite uh, a simple and elegant system. You see on the bottom there we have the stainless uh, heat exchange plate. It's laid at the bottom of the go base container you put the liner on top of it and fill the liner with grapes and do the fermentation. This go cooler has a set a valve with it and a return line. So you connect that to the coolant which comes in and then whenever the fermenter needs cooling and that's sensed by the temperature probe that's inside the fermenting must, it opens this valve electrically, lets the coolant go through and the coolant goes through the exchanger and back to your recirculating uh, chill water return. So this is how you can cool the fermenter without any contact. You can have multiple go coolers running in your facility, all running at different temperatures in the fermentation. Punching is uh, simple. Most of you know how it's done. You, you uh, cause the secondary chamber to inflate, it crushes the fermenting must, it hits the cap, squashes it, disperses the cap, and then the CO2 builds up again, and this happens automatically or manually whenever you want. Here's a video of how this looks in real life. You can see the blue inflating chamber in the back. It's inflated it, and now actually the whole thing is deflating again. Very simple, completely automatic punch, completely sealed. Pressing is where the go fermenter is quite unique. 
Uh, we did the uh, pressing episode in episode six about two weeks ago. So you can look at that episode to get a lot of details. But in terms of your winery requirements, you need a self-priming wine pump. You don't need a must pump because you're only going to pump clean wine. But you need something that can pump over 10 to 20 gallons per minute and is capable of self-priming. A uh, flexible impeller pump is a good choice. A pneumatic diaphragm pump is a good choice. You need to do this operation with about a two inch hose with two inch tri-clamps. The bag has two inch tri-clamps, so everything is standardized to a two inch tri-clamp. So we supply you with the uh, dip tube, to the pressing tube, I'm sorry, to, to do this operation. And you can use a smart barrel dip tube and a smart barrel liner to collect the wine, or you can use any container that you have. So the process is simple. You take out the sampling port, you put in the press tube, you connect it to your pump, the pump pumps out the free run into your collection vessel, then you cause the system to inflate the secondary chamber, it squeezes the pumice dry, you take the liner out, throw it away the pumice, you're done. So here's how it looks in real life. You see the press tube there on the left, it goes into the liner at time of pressing. This is connected to a little um, a diaphragm pump in this case, going to the collection vessel, which is a smart barrel. I show on the inset an electrical version of this pump. Uh, this happens to be a flexible impeller pump, and you can use this uh, in, instead of the uh, pneumatic diaphragm pump. If you have compressed air, the diaphragm pump is really a convenient, inexpensive way to go. And again, our resource guide gives you some potential suppliers and model numbers for these pumps. We don't have any connection with suppliers, but we offered as to help you to find something that we know works with our equipment. So after the wine is made, the next step, which will go on for several months, is racking. And in racking, we're basically allowing uh, things to settle. We're doing uh, secondary malolactic fermentations. Uh, we're letting the wine uh, oxygenate a little bit, aging, and typically it'll go on for about three to four months. So in the red wine, we generally start with our smart barrel, which has high oxygen permeability. And this allows some microoxygenation. As things settle, it goes to a secondary bag with low permeability and so on and so forth down the line. Now, by using the smart barrel instead of the conventional tankage, there are many advantages. First of all, there's no headspace in a smart barrel. So there's no topping and there's no fear of oxidation because something was open or your floating lid hung up or the gasket failed. Uh, there's no worries of that. It's a single use system, so there's no cleaning involved in the process. And there's no worry that the tankage wasn't cleaned properly or a fitting wasn't dismantled. It's a one use bag. You get it perfectly clean and you discard it after use. So there's no tankage needed. So there's no cost of tanks, no installation, no getting building permits to install a tank, and no tank just sitting there doing nothing all year. Also, instead of having a chilled area for racking to keep a temperature under control, you can actually use go coolers in our go bases. So you could have essentially a warehouse space that is not particularly uh, temperature controlled, but use go coolers to keep your whites at say 55 degrees during racking, your reds hotter maybe at 65 or 70. Uh, remember, to get good malolactic fermentation, you really want a little warmer temperature. You really want about 65 to encourage malolactic fermentation, and then you may want to cool it after that's done. So consider the smart barrel as a racking method and eliminate all the tankage that you need for your new winery. Facility-wise, we really don't have many serious demands. Uh, we have customers that just use warehouse space. Here's an example. Uh, well, this uh, customer has about 10 units. Here are five or six of them piled up. In the back, you see all these uh, wooden barrels. So this particular customer is very fond of wooden barrels. So I have not been able to convince him to get rid of these wooden barrels and go to nice, easy to use, cheap, smart barrel liners, but we're working on it, we're working on it. So you can see that in this warehouse space, he has nothing special. Um, he does have an area he can handle these as pallets. You need some kind of forklift or pallet jack. Utilities I mentioned earlier, standard electrical service. There's no need for any real environmental control. You don't need to humidify something or keep it particularly cool. 
And you do need a recirculating chilled water glycol system of some kind. This is uh, important to control temperature and especially for white wines. You really need to be below 62 to make a decent white wine. So this is what you need. What don't you need? You don't need humidification. If you're not going to use wooden barrels, you don't need to humidify your area. You don't need tanks, totes, barrels, carboys, all kinds of winery junk. Don't need it. You don't need a press because as you remember, we press in the fermentation liner. You also don't need any steaming facility because there's really nothing to clean. You don't need a cleaning station or detergents or anything like that. You don't need to worry about wastewater treatment because you're not cleaning anything. So facility, why not? You can elect to do this in a really fancy building or you can do it in a warehouse. For example, this one I showed you a picture is this industrial um, sort of a um, rental area. Our winery at Sky Acres is inside a old horse barn. And from the outside, it looks like a perfectly normal horse barn, but inside it's all full of go fermenters and smart lighters. Some other functions that I didn't talk about, you know, blending, bottling, labeling, and quality control. These are very important in the winery operation. Um, and we'll do blending, bottling, and labeling in maybe the next episode or perhaps the one after that. Now, the last slide I have here is really a kind of an idea of cost. Now, this is a difficult slide because you may have certain components or you may want to elect to use something more complicated, but it gives you some idea what a winery will cost you. Again, we're looking at something, you know, 1,000 cases, 5,000 cases. So let's look at the fermentation first. Okay, one ton capacity, the liner is $100. You're going to take one liner every run. The go fermenter for go base is about 1700 The temperature control uh, probe and the sampler is a $500 option. And the go cooler is $600. And you really need the fermenter and the base. The other two are options, but really almost required. Racking, typically $25 a liner. It depends on size. The smart barrel kits, you need one for each smart barrel liner that's in use, is about $125. And you can buy either go bases to hold the liners in them, or you can just use any macro bins or half macro bins, whatever you want. The liners are quite flexible. They can be used in any kind of container that will prevent them from uh, sloshing around. Something to hold them in place. And then the support gear, you, need, you should budget for about 10 to 20,000. Um, it depends. If you don't have a destemmer, it's about $2,500 for a destemmer. Hoses and fittings, $500. Pallet jack, if you haven't got one, is about two, three hundred bucks. Uh, a wine pump runs about $2,500 to $4,500. And remember, the wine pump is a primary piece of equipment. You're going to need it to do the pressing, and you're also going to need it to do all the racking. You're going to go from smart barrel liner to a smart barrel liner, and you're going to transfer by pump. The chiller is probably the biggest cost in the system and you can buy off the shelf for $2,000 to $5,000, or you can have an AC contractor build something into the facility, and that generally is a cheaper idea. Build you a small chiller, a pump, and a, a tank to hold the coolant. Then you have some other odds and ends, racking hoses, uh, and then if you're going to go all the way through the system, you can buy a semi-automatic bottler for about $3,000. Corkers, depending on what you want, hand to fully automatic, the cost varies. And then about $1,000 in laboratory gear, pH meter, bricks meter, things like that. And that's pretty much what you need to set up a small winery. So that's our show for this week. If you have any questions, send them by text to the number on the screen, 908-672-0986. 908-672-0986. Or email me at vsing at gofermenter.com.